Good evening, and thank you all for coming. Welcome to the 2023 Ina Levine Annual Lecture, Trauma, Privilege, and Adventure, Jewish Refugees in Iran and India. I'm Betsy Anthony, the Director of Visiting Scholar Programs at the Jack, Joseph, and Morton Mandel Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies. I'm honored to provide an introduction to this endowed lecture a program of the Mandel Center. And I'd like to begin this evening with special words of thanks to the William S. and Ina Levine Foundation, and <clears throat> in particular to its founder, Bill Levine. Bill is a former presidential appointee to the United States Holocaust Memorial Council and a longtime friend and supporter of the museum and of the Mandel Center. Tonight's program and many others are due to the generosity of families like the Levines. We're so grateful for their thoughtful support. I'd also like to recognize and thank the members of the Mandel Center's Academic Advisory Board who are in our audience today. We're also very grateful for your service and commitment to the museum and are happy to have you here in person with us this evening. And now, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. Atina Grossman is Professor of History at the Cooper Union for the Advancement of Science and Art in New York City. She teaches courses on global history, modern Europe, fascism and national socialism, the Holocaust, refugees and migration in a transnational context, and gender and sexuality studies. Her previous research has focused on the history of women, feminism, sexual politics, and population policy in Weimar, Nazi, and in post-war Germany. Professor Grossman has received fellowships from the Davis Center at Princeton University, the American Academy in Berlin, the German Marshall Fund, the American Council of Learned Societies, and the National Endowment for the Humanities. She also has held guest professorships at the Friedrich Schiller University, Jena, the Humboldt University, Berlin, and the University of Haifa. She's a member of the Academic Advisory Board of the Fritz Bauer Institute for Holocaust Research and Education in Frankfurt, and is on the editorial board of the American Historical Review. Professor Grossman's many publications include her books, Reforming Sex, Birth Control and Abortion, Reform in Germany, and Jews, Germans, and Allies, Close Encounters in Occupied Germany. She has an abundance of articles to her name, too many to mention just now, but she has written widely on Jews in post-war Germany and Jews in post-war Europe in general, Jews who survived the Holocaust in the Soviet Union, and the humanitarian work of the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee. Her most recent publication, Jewish Refugees in Iran and India, 
will be included in the volume titled Colonialism and the Jews in German History, which comes out in early 2024. And in addition to all that, we are proud to say that Atina is the 2022-2023 Ina Levine Invitational Fellow here at the Mandel Center. She's here to speak to you tonight about her research on Jewish refugees in Iran and India. Her lecture will be followed by a discussion and Q&A with the Mandel Center's director, Lisa Leff. The index cards that you received as you were entering were provided for you to write questions to be turned into our colleagues who will collect them when that time comes. Following the lecture, you are, as always, invited to a reception in the museum's Hall of Witness to meet with Professor Grossman and our other guests. And now, I'm pleased to introduce to you the Anna Levine Invitational Scholar, Professor Tina Grossman, as she delivers her lecture, Trauma, Privilege, and Adventure, Jewish Refugees in Iran and India. Please join me in welcoming Professor Grossman to the podium. Thank you, Betsy, for that uh, introduction. And I should say that that article, it's actually out. And um, half of what you're going to want to have the answer to tonight and don't get, just read the article. Uh, so uh, first of all, I'm really very happy and honored to be here and really delighted that we can do this uh, in person and uh, that we are slowly but surely becoming more of an in-person community also on the fifth floor. And I want to, of course, particularly thank uh, Betsy uh, for being the heart and soul of our fellows program, Lisa Leff for all of her support and for agreeing to be my interlocutor uh, tonight, especially Jocelyn Barrett, who's really been indispensable uh, in helping me with my technophobia and uh, dealing with all of my silly PowerPoint questions. The amazing reference librarians, as you all know, Megan, Livio, Elliot, who make this research possible. And really to everyone here who makes our life work, from the security staff to the cleaning staff who seem to be in constant motion, uh, German and Sean from IT support, and of course, especially to my fellow fellows. Uh, you know, it really is that intellectual community that is finally really coming together uh, in person on the fifth floor that makes this fellowship and uh, this year that I've spent here on and off um, uh, so very, very valuable and special. Uh, okay, so trauma, privilege, and adventure. Jewish refugees. A recent obituary by the JTA, the Jewish Telegraph Agency, for Hedda Kleinfeld Schachter, the legendary doyen, or mogul, as some news outlets dubbed her, of the bridal industry, founder of Kleinfeld's, the Brooklyn bridal superstore, and famous for her TLC show, Say Yes to the Dress, my daughter is getting married next week, described her as a Holocaust survivor who died at age 99 after a hugely successful and creative career in New York. However, the text below the headline reveals a different story about refugees from Nazi Europe in transit in the global South. Hedda, it turns out, spent two highly formative teenage years in Cuba after her father's release from Dachau and a failed effort to secure passage to Shanghai. It was there in a Havana town square that according to her granddaughter, the teenage boys of her youth flirted with her and taught her how to dance and inspired her passion for celebration and wedding dresses designed for dancing. This headline, I think, illustrates how we efface, marginalize, even sometimes entirely ignore the impact of that time in between, particularly in non-Western locales, perceived perhaps as exotic, but mainly as frustrating, difficult interruptions of passage 
to new homes in more desirable locations, usually further north or west, that remain closed or excruciatingly hard to reach for Jews trying to flee the Nazis, literally throughout the entire globe. And here we have the globe in 1938. Much of my work in the past years, and now as a fellow this year, has focused on trying to understand the meaning of those transnational journeys in both history and memory, and how they can be, and I'm glad to say increasingly are, integrated into Holocaust studies. This evening, I'd like to think with you about these questions, generally for a moment, and then specifically in relation to my own research on mostly German-speaking Central European refugees in Iran and India, including, as you already have seen, as you will see and hear, my own family history. And there are so many sources. Here at the museum, family collections, oral histories, audio interviews, films, photographs, Sometimes the accompanying information supplied by the photo archives is a research trove in itself. Amazing records from other repositories that are, cop from, are in copies here, such as the World Jewish Congress files for Asia, UNRWA reports on India, documentary films from the Polish army in exile shot in Iran, produced in England and preserved by the Imperial War Museum. And of course also the archives of the JDC, the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, the National Archives, the German Foreign Ministry, the India office at the British Library, which is always a whiff of empire still, and the ever-expanding body of new comparative work and publications highlighted particularly now in the German Historical Institute's Global Transit Project and the summer uh, Holocaust Museum Zoom workshops in 2022, led by Ron Zwickenberg and Kimberly Cheng. And finally, the dauntingly extensive set of letters and memorabilia from my own parents' experience in the quote, Orient. They all speak to a colonial or imperial turn, if you will, in Holocaust studies, a focus on the entangled problems of race, class, gender, and different registers of racism in the encounters between desperate European Jewish refugees and colonial or quasi-colonial subjects and authorities in mostly, but not always, temporary flight destinations. The more I've been delving into this material, and I've been doing it for a while, the more thorny my questions about what is, I think, an emerging field are globalizing the Holocaust, decolonizing it, decentering, investigating global transit in order to recenter it, figure out how it fits into the narrative of Holocaust history and memory in this global context here. In history, in memory, in scholarship, but also in public culture, in films, museums, and in journalism, as in at a Kleinfeld's obituary. What are the stakes when we attend to this off-center piece of Holocaust history, directly affecting relatively few people in the context of the European catastrophe and its millions of victims and refugees? What do we signal when we use this term, which denotes such varied experiences in terms of duration, Different temporalities clearly mattered, could stretch from very short stopovers to periods of months and years, often over a decade, sometimes for decades or even for a lifetime, but still often in transit. Location mattered, of course. Whether one landed in a colony as in India, East Africa, or the Caribbean, a quasi-independent and later allied occupied monarchy, Iran, a relatively autonomous parts of the British Empire, South Africa, Australia, Canada. It married, it married, it mattered if one landed in a sovereign non-European state, as in Latin America, where Bolivia alone, as one of my fellow fellows right now, Sandra Gruna Domic, is uncovering, 
provided refuge to some 20,000 Jews. In a European port, Lisbon, temporarily safe from the Nazis, but anxiously seeking an exit from the continent. In the international city of Shanghai, and then in a quasi ghetto under Japanese occupation. Or of course, in the territory where the great majority of Polish Jews who survived endured the war, the Soviet Union. After 1941, mostly in the also quasi-colonial territories of Central Asia, which is actually how I got to this research in the first place. And of course, numbers mattered, whether in probably only the hundreds, like in Tehran, or somewhere between two and five to 6,000 in India, or in the several hundreds thousands in the Soviet Union. Trajectories differed also according to place of origin, profession, occupation, gender, family configuration, and as Hedda Kleinfeld shows, definitely age. Children and youth had very distinct and often happier experiences than their elders. Moreover, and we tend to overlook this when we think about the fate of European Jewry, the presence or not of significant local Jewish communities and the degree of interaction between Mizrahi and Ashkenazi Jews mattered, especially relevant for my work for South and East Asia are so-called Baghdadi Jews, the Anglo-Asian global Jewish elite that occupied certainly in India another kind of in-between position, navigating among British colonial officials and settlers, colonized Indians, including indigenous Indian Jews, B'nai Israel community, and European refugees. In all cases, as we shall see, the fate of European Jewish refugees, certainly in Iran and India, cannot be separated from the backdrop of empire, nationalism, anti-British colonialism on the one hand, and the encroaching war and genocide on the other. And you can see how the map already changes from 1930 to 1944. So let me move uh, to two quotes, although it'll take me a few moments to get to the second one. Uh, the first comes from an eight-page, single-spaced, typed Bericht report. Tehran, December 1st, 1936. Mailed in multiple copies to friends and family, gathered in a new post-1933 diaspora, connected precariously but insistently by letters, postcards, telegrams, circulating from Tehran, Bombay, after 1939, internment camps in British India and throughout the empire, all over the globe again to London, to Jerusalem, to Tel Aviv, to Cape Town, to Buenos Aires, to Bogota, to California, New York, and back to family and friends who remain trapped in Berlin. And here they are, the lives left behind. This is a final family photo uh, on my paternal side from 1938, a last uh, visit together. And as is so often the case, the younger people in the photo survived, the older people did not. Uh, one carbon copy of this document that I'm talking about, preserved by its author, arrived with him in New York City eight years later in September 1946, where I unearthed it in an Upper West Side closet over a half century later, and thanks to the Levine Fellowship, only read in my little office on the fifth floor in October of 2022. The text was written by one among, I hasten to say many of my primary sources. My father, he's the second one over here on my side. A 34 year old disbarred communist fellow traveler, Jewish lawyer from Berlin who had arrived in Tehran a year earlier in 1935. He begins the by noting that he writes mainly about what seems unfamiliar, strange, exotic to a European. Therefore, he cautions, the reader might easily come to the wrong conclusion. As if, quote, I was sitting here in the middle of the Orient and everything was totally different than 
by Utz. This is to a large extent true, he writes, zu einem recht großen Teil zutreffend, but not, he insists, as much as his readers might imagine when they saw the postmark from Iran. He is, as he writes, fascinated, bemused, bewildered, situated between roles and identities, a delighted tourist dispatching travelogues back to Europe and indeed back to this family trapped in Berlin. An uprooted immigrant trying to put together a living and a refugee, anxious about his own uncertain fate and that of those left behind. And these are clearly overlapping identities. But certainly when it came to Iran and India, with their long histories of political, trade, economic, cultural ties to Germany, he and his fellow refugees did not, I want to stress this, land in entirely unknown and unfamiliar places. Their destinations were not blank slates. And these documents came because the destinations were not blank slates. Refugees relied on colleagues from the region, as well as on existing transnational business, professional, and personal connections that could facilitate and encourage, with an offer of employment or a letter of introduction, urgent flight to places that might not have been a first choice. Persian and Indian students, medicine, dentistry, engineering, or business partners, whether rug dealers or contractors for railroad or road construction, were highly visible in Paris, London, Berlin, where their presence was a key feature of interwar imperial cosmopolitanism, cemented in some cases by marriage and romance, I'll get back to that in a minute, or rarely even conversion to the spiritual practices of Islam or Hinduism. Moreover, the cultural imaginary circulated particularly by Weimar mass media in illustrated magazines, travel memoirs, photographs, films, novels, offered a rich array of images of the world beyond Europe, certainly the Americas, but also the Orient, both enticing and frightening. That was maybe the dominant feeling about Shanghai, which accompanied refugees. These pre-existing links are omnipresent once we start to look. In the traditions of German and German Jewish Orientalist scholarship, in the touristic gaze of the feuilleton, and in the urban streetscape. In Berlin, the Hindustan Cafe, in the heart of commercial Jewish asphalt culture, on the corner of Kudam and Townsendstraße, was a hub for radical students, Asian and German, young leftists. Persian students published radical anti-Shah newsletters, and the radical chic scene in Berlin Charlottenburg could gather in a mosque led by Hugo Marcus, a Jewish convert, and hear lectures by sexologist Magnus Hirschfeld. Language tutoring and other local knowledge provided by students prepared refugees for emigration. How these connections continue to play out after the Nazis came to power is another part of the story we could maybe discuss in the Q&A. Oops. Oh, I'm bad at this. <laughs> uh, with this as background to his quite involuntary and somewhat accidental journey to Tehran, different from my mother's story, my father embarked on his amateur reportage career while settling into a rapidly changing city, cobbling together a living as a legal advisor, hence the calling card, bilingual, and as an import-export, that Jewish trade, uh, it, trader in the bazaar. Endangered as a leftist and physically expelled as a non-Aryan from the Berlin courthouse, Hazigro, as he had Dada-like, abbreviated his Germanic name, as you see, Hans Sigismund Kossmann, Dr. Hans Sigismund Kossmann, needed to get out of the new Nazi Germany fast and just happened to have an Armenian girlfriend with family in Tehran willing to welcome him. And that is, if you notice, the slightly darker skinned woman sitting not next to him was Anna Amerian. Uh, that their relationship itself 
an example of the transnational movement between Germany and Iran. And that motorcycle will uh, become an important part of the story. This is from the Persian German Chamber of Commerce. He writes his Berichte, his, I think of them as Feuilleton Tehran, in the self ironizing Berliner Schnauze style of a Weimar Rasender reporter, traveling reporter. And, and it's a very typical style if you read these refugee letters, it's not unique. He pens, types, literally hundreds of densely detailed descriptions of Iran in the 1930s as it underwent the rapid authoritarian modernization, or as he phrased it in the language of the left, state monopoly capitalism imposed by Reza Shah Pahlavi. Streets were dug up to install 6,000 eagerly awaited tele telephone connections. Die Segnungen der Kultur, the blessings of culture, sarcasm intended and sewage systems to replace the rivulets on the side of streets used for both waste and washing and even drinking by the poor. Europeans, mostly mistrusting even city fountains, trek to the only truly trustworthy sources of drinking water at the Shah's palace or the British embassy. Hence the monikers English is Vasa or Shah Vasa. The Trans-Iranian Railroad inched its way from the Caspian to within one kilometer of Tehran, where a German company was constructing a much too large new train station, and that's the one you see in those wartime newsreels. New roads cut into the maze of the old bazaar with its babel, Sprachgewimmel, of cultures and languages. Jews, Turks, Arabs, Indians, Armenians, Syrians, Assyrians, Copts, Chaldeans, this new Tehran with a few multi-story buildings, opera, the central post office, whose boîte postale would become such a crucial lifeline of connection and information and rumor. The Café Paris, where one danced with vodka and caviar into the early hours. This new Tehran was frequented by a multicultural mix of middle-class Iranians, foreigners of all kinds, and the relatively small number of Central European Jews in the hundreds, the Radfahrer colony, as he called it, the bicycle riders colony, that's a German Jewish joke, we can interpret it later. Keenly attuned to gender conventions, he tries to figure out social norms and how they apply to Europeans. He observes most dramatically how the Shah's unpopular 1936 imposition of a ban on the veil has led to police prowling the streets ripping tightly tied scarves off the heads of women who still ventured out, ironically now more restricted without their shadors or their veils in their access to public space than before the secularizing reforms. This modernization, on the other hand, offered opportunities to multilingual unmarried European women like Erica, my mother. And I don't know if you can see, but the letterhead of this letter that she's writing is Palais de Justice, where she's working as a secretary. And of course, she is shopping bareheaded and short-sleeved uh, in actually in the provinces. At the same time, Hazigo marvels at those oriental customs. Persian merchants are not, as his readers might assume, crooks and cheats out to trick foreigners, but simply good, clever businessmen with whom he partners in the bazaar. He orients himself by frequent recourse to still vivid European images. The mountains around Tehran remind him of the Alps. The Russian or European trained physicians in Tehran are every bit as skilled as the ones he might have relied upon in Berlin. Although there, in the absence of the many tropical maladies that beset Europeans, he had less need of them. Farsi was like Hebrew in that one really needed to know the language in order to read the script and understand what one was reading. And here you see Erica's notebook with an uh, image of the crown prince, the next Shah on the cover, and her uh, practice, which she had already started before uh, leaving Berlin. 
He is relieved that unlike many of his compatriots, he has arrived in time to decipher Tehran's topography and basic Farsi before the Shah's nationalist initiatives led in 1936 to the removal of all non-Farsi script from public signage. That move left many Europeans who had mistakenly accepted the modernization program to move more along the lines of the Turkish reforms, that is towards greater use of Latin lettering, often literally lost. For the most part, stranded in precarious safety on the margins of their collapsing and ever more devastated Jewish Euro European world, refugees lived as these hybrids, emigrants, travelers, refugees, themselves on the margins of these geographic margins. Expelled and in flight from homelands that had condemned them as racially inferior, they now encountered and benefited from a different form of racialized colonial hierarchy and fraught white skin privilege. And here you see so the two examples. I always think of this as the yekka, those of you who know that word, right? The German Jew in his jacket in the desert, and then the border crosser, much more comfortable in the mountains, uh, also in the desert. And here, if we speak about a different form of racialized colonial hierarchy and white skin privilege, you see my parents and their friends at the ski resort Derbant, which was also frequented by middle-class Iranians, surrounded by local bearers and servants, a quintessential racialized image, one would think, of European privilege, recalling also the Alpine vacations they remembered. So they occupied a peculiar ambivalent in-between position, which you can see sort of, I think, literally with these two side-by-side -side letters here. On the left from Tehran, a page from a report, a trip to the, quote, orient of the past or a journey from Iran to Persia. That is to say, a journey out from the city to, into the interior. And on the other side, a letter from Berlin, September 20th, 1940, addressed to Erica, my mother. So they partake indeed with their journey of privilege and adventure, but they are not part of a colonial or occupier elite and are always shadowed by this emerging catastrophe, displaced, uprooted, anxiously uncertain, ceaselessly worried about those left behind. And strikingly, and there's thanks in this letter, at a time in 1940-41, when Iran was plagued by food shortages and high inflation, refugees are sending packages of beans, sugar, lard, and other foodstuffs from Tehran to their parents in Judenhäuser in Berlin. Multidirectionality. Moreover, Moreover, as Hazihiro reflects, with both the cultural condes condescension of someone encountering a less advanced civilization, but also, I think, with genuine appreciation, quote, there is a warmth here, a lack of the distance, Fremtheit, among people which reconciles one to much that is strange and difficult. And it was strange and difficult. So I would suggest that we find here and in many accounts by other German and Austrian Jews, something more complicated and multi-layered than what, and I was part of this, I must say, might have called a complicit European colonizing gaze. Productively pressured by younger historians, many of them, I am happy to note, connected with the Mandel Center, Kimberly Chang, Pragya Kao, Ryan Sun, many more, with a language and cultural fluency that Europeanists like myself lack, historians of Jewish refugees in the global South are now rather belatedly and necessarily thinking with the tools of a post-colonial critical lens. This analytic approach is indispensable. However, the position, for example, of a Weimar cosmopolitan entering another not entirely unfamiliar cosmopolitan space in Tehran or Bombay, who is seeing also through the lens of photojournalism and the feuilleton, 
already has some knowledge of the local language and culture acquired in part from students involved in a common international left movement also matters. The onset of war and the arrival of allied troops in Iran and the intensified British military presence and production in India generates an even more multinational, multicultural society. And this is just to remind you of the importance of Tehran and of Iran as one of the main non-combat uh, centers, theaters of war in the Second World War. Here, the arrival of the Anders Polish government and exile army from Central Asia on their way to the European theater, moving through uh, Iran on their then to Palestine, then to Italy, and of course the Tehran children who remained only very briefly but are much better known. And then as just one other reminder, uh, an image of the Tehran conference, uh, late November, early December 1943, uh, where Iran had become a central, central place for Lend-Lease, uh, for the Persian Gulf Command, and indeed for so much of uh, the war effort and for allied uh, collaboration, United States, Britain, and the Soviet Union. In contrast, moving on to India, let's consider a second excerpt. I promised you two <laughs> sets of quotes. This one from a lengthy audio interview in the Holocaust Museum archives conducted in Sydney on May 8th, 1984, Harold G. Jensen, formerly Hans, recounts his passage from Eastern Germany as a youth to an apprenticeship designed to prepare him for emigration in Hamburg and his family's flight to Bombay. This is not his bar mitzvah, he's older, another refugee. With the help of a distant relative who had already settled in Bombay as an ENT specialist in 1934, the 18-year-old arrived in February 39 with no formal education beyond this very brief apprenticeship. While his cardiologist's father found a position in the provinces, relatives quickly arranged employment for the teenager in the spinning and weaving wheels owned by Sir Victor Sassoon, the playboy skiad and also a critical player in refugee aid in both Bombay and Shanghai during the war of the Baghdadi Jewish Sassoon dynasty that had hooked its fortunes for better and then for worse to the by then beleaguered British empire facing world war and working class anti-colonial agitation. The David Sassoon mills named after the founder early 19th century among Bombay's largest employers hired B'nai Israel Jews, as dark as the Indians or even darker, Hans remembered, and skirting the law, Jewish enemy aliens like Hans. In his account of the precarious but also tangible benefits of white skin privilege, the young refugee was, quote, paid like an Indian, 50 rupees a month, but I was a European, earning as little as they did, lived in the same bungalow, and yet they knew I was a European, and that caused me problems. His Indian co-workers were, quote, angry that he enjoyed entry to places open only to Europeans, especially Candy Beach, where he could swim on his one day off, on their one day off. Hans was painfully in between, not popular with his co-workers, who were suspicious of this intruder, while the mill manager would not deign to talk to him because he worked alongside Indians. Recounting his story years later in Australia, Jensen vividly recalled his acute discomfort with this ambiguous role as a laborer in the Sassoon plant. In another register, he describes the shock of being carted off for internment as an enemy alien, a fate from which the Sassoons could not rescue him. Yet, in another example of enduring privilege, he stresses that the connections he forged with Indian colleagues while climbing up the ladder into those management positions from which he was initially excluded, eventually even into a commission in the Indian, not British, army, proved highly valuable, 
for the prosperous life he was eventually able to establish for himself and his family as a jute and flax merchant in Australia who did business with India. Global transit would have many afterlives. In his audio interview, and Louis Jortner, a child refugee, he was nine, described a comfortable life in Bombay where he was hyper aware of, quote, being white and having money in a very poor country. Our acquaintances were European. Yet some of his classmates in the elite British school he attended were upper class, upper caste Indians. And he recalled vividly a memorable conversation during his walk to school with a Hindu boy who announced with passionate conviction, quote, independence is coming. We're going to be free of the British. I remember being intimidated. Lewis carefully followed the progress of the war. He knew that that affected him, but he, quote, didn't know anything about the anti-colonial struggle. He had heard of Gandhi. His classmate was, quote, more passionately vocal than anybody else I knew, and it impressed him and also intimidated him. Everyday life for these German, Austrian, some Italian, Axis national Jewish refugees, their numbers are frustratingly unclear, as I said, between two and five, even 6,000, depending perhaps on the date and how you define Jewish, was of course replete with these contradictions, even more so in colonial India than Iran. They were European, but not British, and starting in fall 1939, enemy aliens, sometimes even suspect enemy agents, scrambling to stay afloat, safe, but certainly not secure, often for variably lengths of time behind the barbed wire of internment camps. Married women in India, not too many in this photo, women, but you see them, sometimes took on or at least performed the roles of British colonial matrons, especially if their husbands had acquired positions as physicians, engineers, plant managers outside the major cities, assuming with a certain alacrity management of households with numerous servants, entertaining allied officers, local officials, affluent neighbors, while also clinging, as Lewis recalled, to refugee social circus, circles and sometimes religious observance. They strove to uphold colonialist mores while navigating the climate and its associated maladies, their children's education, often in boarding schools and far away in cooler hill stations where they were separated from parents for months at a time. Women collected gossip, kept track of illicit affairs, nervous and physical breakdowns, tried their hand at matchmaking, and in India spent time packing for and trying to maintain family life during internment. It's a story that needs more detail. Women worked, often many jobs at once, as housekeepers or managers in the many bed and breakfast boarding houses, offering a semblance of Central European home and cooking, as secretaries in refugee organizations or multinational businesses, bookkeepers for firms, music tutors, and as domestics, common female refugee occupation. Berta Hellinger's story can stand in for many, a young widow from Vienna, she came to Calcutta, sponsored by a relative's British neighbor, initially worked as a domestic, and then operated a boarding house in the hill station of Darjeeling. Her daughter, like many middle-class European and Indian girls, was sent to a Catholic Loretta convent boarding school, then to secretarial school, after which she worked for a British company. Berta's son apprenticed to a Baghdadi Jewish photographer, and worked as a salesman for a multinational company in Bombay. Calcutta is fascinating. Pragya Kaul is coming soon. Um, you'll hear more. In interviews, local Jews like Flower Silliman and also Indian neighbors recall the sudden presence of Jewish refugees who became prominent in the city's vibrant cultural life. Physicians, musicians, architects, teachers, and also the additional presence after 41 of allied, especially American Jewish GIs from the Pacific Front who were welcomed by the Mizrahi Jewish community. Young single women inhabited different positions, often suspect as women of loose morals, vulnerable to a putative white slave trade, which made it more difficult for them to acquire entry visas. And also like married women restricted in practicing professions, um, although again, 
secretarial and domestic work was open to them. Okay. Uh, some more comments. Uh, photos in the uh, museum collection, I think, alert us very nicely to this ambiguity of Jewish refugee status and how difficult it can be to read the evidence, further complicating the framework of this colonial or even touristic gaze. So this image, which is filed under the tag Bombay, depicts this young European girl, Joanna Klein, posing by a seaside wall with an Indian man. The family preserved the photo, presumably as a souvenir of a very brief stopover on their long but relatively straightforward sea voyage to safety. Others paused on their way to Palestine or to Shanghai. The lucky ones, like the Kleins, were sailing to the US with another stop in Cape Town. Here, a group of young men pose in front of a monument to a British monarch, like tourists in the empire. In fact, they were on an 850 day journey from Lithuania via Kobe, Shanghai and Bombay to Palestine. Granted a three month residency in India, they too worked briefly in the Sassoon mills. Far from planning to settle in this ever more unstable colony, they were en route to become settlers in another part of the empire, but one that they felt belonged to them. She becomes an American girl, they become pioneers in the yeshuv. Consider now these photos of Court Goldstein's villa in Madras, a photo album preserved at Chappelle. A chemist, he had arrived from Breslau shortly after Kristallnacht, the beneficiary of business and professional connections, and was living, as you see, a rather luxurious colonial style home with its veranda. They even had an inflatable swimming pool and on the website, I had found this photo and one of his identity card, Empire of India Certificate of Identity, apparently securing him a place in India. But once we juxtapose these photos and their brief captions with a larger, not yet, thankfully, digitized collection, a quite different picture emerges, which challenges or at least relativizes my paradigm of colonial privilege. The available evidence can be tricky. Goldstein and his family only enjoyed that villa for about a year. He, his and other Jewish refugee situation was radically different than that of Britishers or other non-Axis refugees. By fall, he had been exiled from Madras to a British internment camp, 39. The identity card for the Empire of India that at first looked so reassuring was in fact just a stopgap document valid for a single journey to the US by a stateless person in lieu of any valid passport. Detained with his wife and young son in a parole center in Air Code in central India, he wages that all too familiar paper war for escape, albeit under the frustrating conditions of allied internment rather than imminent threat by the Nazis. And here you see the work of the Jewish Relief Association trying to find those positions in the first place. And here we have these paper wars. A letter of, that uh, you see here, one from January 4th, 1941, where he's almost getting to success, not quite. But he starts on October 2nd, 1940, with a letter from the American consulate in Madras requesting his presence. Goldstein responds from Lakeview Cottage in Parole Center, Ercot, on October 5th, asking for further details so that he could apply to briefly leave the camp and to, quote, prove the urgency of my journey. We can read the urgency and frustration in these many polite exchanges. He writes to the government of India, to the district magistrate of Madras, to the commander of the internment camp, to the American consul in Madras, to the vice consul, to the American consulate in Berlin. All the paperwork has to go through Berlin. Thomas Cook shipping agents, shipping lines, medical certificates that he has no, he and his family have no loathsome diseases have to be procured. Quota numbers have limited validity. Time runs out. He has to start over. Everything via cable, all at his own expense while interned without any income. Finally, on April 26th, so he still has a half year to go almost, success. 
under the wire before the U.S. enters the war and the trans-ocean routes are shut down. Three second-class berths on the SS President Grant, sailing from Bombay, April 26, 1941. The Goldsteins are lucky. Kurt has a brother in Lakewood, New Jersey, who can supply affidavits and wire money for tickets and fees. This official correspondence supplements the personal letters, that mobile archive, that circulation we looked at earlier, that includes the missives from loved ones in Nazi Germany arriving in Tehran, in Bombay, Calcutta, in the internment camps and parole centers for enemy aliens and suspect enemy agents set up by the British after 1939, where ironically internees, such as my father, who is actually at the, that import-export stuff in the bazaar catches up with him, reported to have been trading with the enemy, therefore suspected to be an enemy agent with Germany, where ironically internees classified as POWs have access to mail and Red Cross postcards and therefore actually get more mail from within Nazi Germany, which reveal details about Jewish everyday life there. The proverbial stoic brave face vying with hints about the gravity of the situation, gratitude for news and food packages. And there too we find that familiar endless paper war of telegrams, fees, pleas for affidavits, navigating visas, exit permits, the birth that is no longer available when the quota number is secured, the coded letters, the mutual understandings, and always the longing for reunions, the dawning realization that they would never happen. This transnational circulation of information and emotion offers a very interesting, I think, comparative lens on Jewish life and death under Nazism as well as on daily life in unfamiliar new homes, including in Palestine or Latin America, some of those homes permanent, and in global transit within this Orient, striving itself towards independence, engaged in nation building and anti-colonial struggle, but enmeshed in global politics and war. More letters. Pursuing her own adventures in Tehran, Erica, the lady on the donkey, my mother, who had refused to leave with her partner on the planned transit through India to the US in May 1941, which didn't happen, writes to Hazigal in Puranda Family Camp, British India, on September 30th, 1944, responding to his bitterness about being trapped in British internment rather than being able to join the fight against the mutual enemy. This is May, uh, September 44, quote, it gives me a sick feeling imagining you talking about all the missed opportunities for offering revenge for the suffering of our Jewish brethren. We, the spared ones, trying to combat despair. Then it brings in me something very similar to hatred. And then I feel something nearing despair. So the, scar, the scars remain as does the ambivalence about leaving. Finally released from internment, Hazigro writes from Bombay to Erica in Tehran in late 45, hoping to tempt her to join him. She would be fascinated, he says, by its cosmopolitan life, the variety of races, colors, dresses, the hyper-modern city. But there is also indescribable poverty and dirt. And then he tellingly adds, practically no contact between Indians and Europeans, no mutual knowledge and love. And this is different than in Iran, indeed. I call this the Casablanca image, I'm almost done. Uh, December 2nd, 1946, a snowy day. This is Erica's reluctant departure from Tehran with a man hovering behind her, both of them in suspended motion as if paralyzed. And yet she gets on the plane, on her way to the US via Palestine and London, where she will reconnect with surviving family members before moving on to reunite with a fiance she had not seen since their parting in Tehran in May 41. There is much here that I don't know and can only intuit. The gaps in this photo representative of so many silences in letters and oral accounts. The personal relationships forged 
the love affairs with local men, in this case, Atsis Hatami, an Iranian. The lure of staying versus the pull of obligation and family back to the West. The key point remains that whatever the degree of attachment to their transit refuge, the vast majority of Jews left after the war, once the colonial or cosmopolitan authorities who had presided over and in a sense made possible the cosmopolitan cities departed. And certainly when revolution, nationalism, or the violence of partition uh, in the Raj threatened more war and chaos. As Hazigro, by now middle-aged, had also written in that letter while contemplating starting over in the US, certainty in every respect has left me more than 12 years ago. In other words, these uprooted, stateless, precariously privileged German-speaking Jewish refugees existed in multiple entangled worlds at the same time. Congealed in these strange homemade badges, the day-to-day -day life of the refugees as they intersected with the home, host society, alluring and fascinating as well as alien and always also with the homes and loved ones left behind. And here you see, he fancies himself, he makes this badge, he's a prisoner of war, and yet he puts a Star of David, he puts his name, he says LLD, Doctor of Laws, and then he lists all of the camps, but they are British camps in which he has been interned. So there's this curious amalgam of identities stitched onto these badges. We can trace a geography of emotions and analyze the emotions of geography for these lives. Lives that plant a street sign in the middle of a refugee camp on the outskirts of Tehran with an arrow pointing to Warsaw, 5,000 plus kilometers, Tehran, three kilometers, where in this case, distant Warsaw is clearly felt as closer than the nearby Iranian capital. German speaking Jews who remain not for months like the Polish refugees who arrived in 42, but for years until at least the end of the war negotiated these distances differently with a different emotional household, but for them too, the European catastrophe loomed large. Transmitted by BBC broadcasts, the trickle of letters, rumors, reports by allied soldiers, the universal experience post-war was the discovery that virtually everyone they had left behind was lost, murdered. The news trickling in via survivor lists published in the Aufbau, communicated by servicemen, and often via the letters from the Red Cross, what we now know as the ITS. Finally, what remains? Some material objects. Persian miniatures, rugs, hand-tailored elegant dresses and shoes, a Quran, but also remembered kavya and vodka from Nauru's feasts in New York. How do these artifacts figure in relations to the mementos from home? Quote, in Berlin or Vienna, once transported in the proverbial lifts to new homes in New York, Tel Aviv, Buenos Aires, haunted by photos of lost family, candlesticks, monogrammed linens from Europe, along with a brick brack of modernist Bauhaus style furniture, and also as we see here, the rugs, the inlaid boxes, the tiny ivory elephants, and that indispensable prisoner's item, a cup from the British internment camp. During the years in the same transit location, refugees forged bonds that shaped their social circles and networks in their new homes, more precious often than those from original homes where the significant interlocutors were dead or had long since themselves migrated onwards. And those formative experiences have become multi-directional and multi-generational. The internet has revealed to me Indian grand and great-grandchildren of refugee Jews, mostly women, who married into local families, only now uncovering and exploring lost Jewish family histories, even applying for EU passports on the basis of those histories, continuing and mapping their own global transit. So returning to my opening question about the stakes of this research for Holocaust studies. In a world where we speak to students, colleagues, readers, audiences who increasingly come with their own stories of displacement, migration, war, refugee life, and travel, these marginal stories become, I think, more and more central. Thank you.
Okay, thank you so much for that really wonderful talk. And um, I wanna, I'm Lisa Leff, the director of the Mandel Center. So good to have you all here. You should have gotten index cards when you came in. And if you have questions, please write on them and then put like, pass them all the way to the ends where people will take them and bring them to me. But that'll take a minute. So maybe I'll begin with a question of my own and I wanna begin with where you ended, which is why um, scholars such as yourself um, who work in Holocaust studies and worked on Germany previously are starting to get so interested in stories of refugees in the global South. You know, you mentioned that our center had a couple of workshops last summer on um, Holocaust in Asia, Holocaust in the global South. You know, this is really a field that's garnering some interest. And I wondered if you had thoughts about why that is, and if I'm even right to call this a field. Well, that was one of the questions that I actually raised. I'm not sure that it's a field, but it's certainly a very interesting and stimulating area of research. I, I think there's several reasons. One has to do, I think, with the initial sense of remapping of Holocaust experience that came with our focus, also very belated, on the survival of Polish Jews in the Soviet Union. And, uh, and the realization that the great majority of, the, of this, you know, these 3.3 million, tragically small 10% of, I mean, of the 330,000 of the 3.3 million uh, Polish Jews who uh, survived had survived because they had escaped behind the lines. Uh, and I mean, I remember when I first started paying attention to that topic, looking at a map actually from the museum that sort of showed where camps were. And then there was this line, it was actually a relatively late map. And then there was a line behind which there was a blank. And that blank space was the unoccupied Soviet Union. And we started to fill in that blank space and realizing that that was such a critical integral part of Holocaust history. And once we'd started to open up the map that far, it made sense. I mean, it also made sense historically because of course from Central Asia, we saw that the passage went on across the Caspian to Iran and through India and then to Palestine and those routes started to emerge on our maps of the globe. So I think that's the first thing. And the second thing, just very quickly, is that I do think uh, that it has to do with being attentive to our times and to uh, the political and social world in which we live and in which we teach, uh, that so many of our students come to us, as I just said briefly, with their own stories of migration, of, um, of forced displacement, histories of genocide, mass killings, uh, that we can no longer automatically assume that there's some sort of privileged interest in the Holocaust. And one way, and I don't think this is opportunist, I think that this is really intellectually and ethically very responsible. Uh, one way to open up interest in our field, Holocaust studies, to this broader uh, audience and to this really new demographic who forms certainly the majority of my students is to make connections uh, with the experience of refugee Jews around the world uh, and how they coped with their own uh, lives of displacement and how they connected to those communities. So there's a lot more to be said, but that would be my quick answer. Yeah, no, thanks. Um, but it raises some questions too. Um, and I'm gonna look out and see if questions are coming in from the audience or if I'm empowered to just keep going. <laughs> um, you know, once once you're putting stories of refugees in these contexts. Oh, thanks. Okay, 
I'll just ask mine and then I'll give it to you. Um, once you're putting them in these contexts, instead of like the more typical ones that we knew previously, like refugees going to Britain, refugees going to Netherlands, refugees going to France, you know, this is really a very different story. And you kind of have to connect it to different historiographies like colonial historiography or post-colonial historiography. How do you do that? How do you see the field doing that? I think that the field is changing for precisely that reason. And in, in certain ways also, you know, the way that I realized that I had reached my limits in uh, working on the story of the Polish Jews in the Soviet Union, which, you know, I came to backwards by uncovering for myself that writing a book about Jewish survivors in post-war Germany, the great majority of the people I was writing about had been in the Soviet Union. <laughs> and then at some point realizing that I was trained as a historian of Germany and not, and I didn't speak Polish and I didn't speak Russian. And I needed to partner with people who did. And I think what is happening in this field, which we have sort of loosely defined, we can talk about how uh, appropriate the term is, global transit, uh, is with this uh, younger emerging uh, group of scholars who are themselves from the region or whose families are from the region, uh, who can read uh, the press in Chinese or in Hindi, uh, or for that matter, in Spanish, uh, or in um, any number of, um, of, of, of languages, where we can really get a concretely multidirectional view of this encounter between people who are defined as colonial subjects and, and therefore racialized and uh, the subjects of racism with this other group of apparently white Europeans who are in flight for their lives uh, because of a rather different uh, form of, race, of, of, of racism. And so I think there's, there, there are a couple of moves that we need to make. One is to be accountable and responsible uh, that we can't do everything, that we need to do this collectively, and that's mm. happening. Uh, we need to know the languages. It's not good enough to, anymore to write about Shanghai um, unless you're writing with people who actually can read Chinese or maybe even Russian or all the multiple languages the same goes for somebody like me working on Iran. Uh, India is a little easier, uh, but still. Uh, so we can, we can do that. And I think, yes, it is a way of engaging with this roiling debate. It's most extreme, of course, in Germany, as I'm sure most of you know at the moment, about the, uh, the connections, the links uh, between colonial crimes and the crimes of the Holocaust. That's a super you know, polemical discussion uh, or has become very polemical. And I think that if we actually look at the concrete experiences mm -hmm. in concrete places, in this very tense, volatile moment of simultaneous anti-colonial struggle and the anti fascist struggle and war and genocide taking place uh, in Europe, then I think we'll be able to understand those connections. And I do believe that they exist uh, in, a, uh, in, in, in a more uh, complex and uh, sophisticated, and yeah, and I, I would venture to say ethical way. So I think, I actually think it's really important politically. I think it's important pedagogically. And I think it's important uh, historically because if we start to put the numbers together, I mean, I didn't know until Sandra told me that there were 20,000, that's the number we usually use for uh, Shanghai or a little less, uh, Central European Jews who went to Bolivia, for example. Once we start adding up the numbers, whether we're talking about Kenya or Jamaica or the Philippines uh, or 
India or, uh, or Singapore uh, or other countries in Latin America, uh, other countries on the African continent, uh, we, are, we will discover that these are extraordinarily important places and we need to understand what people experienced there. And we also need to deal with the fact that for the most part they left. And I also want to stress that it's important to think about how that experience stayed on and lived on in their lives. And I think it did, not just in Hedda Kleinfeld's. Yeah. The, just to keep building, one of the questions that came in um, is asking, you know, can you discuss how you see these stories as distinctive from other stories of exiles or emigres, like the story of Trotsky in Mexico, et cetera? So how is this not just an emigre story? What's Holocaust about it? Right. Uh, right. That's a good way to put it. Uh, I think that's why I was trying to stress the, you know, the trauma piece also of privilege and adventure, uh, which is those who were left behind. And that there is, you know, there is barely a moment in those years where the refugees in whatever situation they are in, more or less privileged, whether they are, you know, frustrated behind barbed wire uh, in a British internment camp or whether uh, they are working as an architect for a Maharaja, uh, where they are not initially still trying to get uh, relatives out of, um, of Nazi-occupied Europe uh, or try to maintain contact. And in any case, constantly, constantly uh, worrying and trying to figure out what's happening, trying to get news, and the reality of uh, realizing once the war was then over uh, that indeed uh, they were dealing uh, with a catastrophe, which they had escaped uh, and were not even able to participate in, uh, in, 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 in fighting against. So uh, it's not like they leave the Holocaust behind, uh, just like they don't leave Europe behind in their uh, in you know in their imaginary or in or in their heads, uh, they, uh, they they live and that's why I think of this term of sort of you know their emotional geographies are are very multi layered. Uh, so in that sense, I do think that it's a different kind of story uh, than uh, that of others who may be. Yeah. And maybe going back moving. to your first answer, that's part of how this connects us to people that we might meet today who have become refugees from tragedy. Yeah. Right. And, and, I, and I think, you know, we all know this. You know, to be able to make those connections doesn't mean that we say those experiences are the same. I mean, you know, it's banal, but we need to always say that. But it is a way of connecting. I want to, we have some questions here about the fact that you're working on your own family's history, and I want to make sure to ask them. Here's a great one. What did you experience in your upbringing that was, you know, connected to their Iranian time? Stories, souvenirs, food, Farsi. You know, what's it like to write about your own family, and how do you find evidence in yourself or your own upbringing of right. this history? Right. I mean, I think that's why I, you know, I, I wanted to make sure that I also brought in the stories that I found at the museum, which were very much not, you know, which are not my stories. I mean, I do not know Harold Jensen or Louis Jordner or Berta Herlinger or uh, any of any number of the many other people whose stories I listen to. I mean, I've become a huge fan of audio interviews at the museum uh, or the you know, really, as I said, amazingly rich collection of, of, of photographs uh, and uh, all the other uh, archival sources that I've used. So I'm trying really to fold the family story into this uh, larger story, 
never mind the fact that I never really got to read these texts until I got here, uh, gave me the time, thank you. Uh, but I think, I think it varies from, you know, from family to family how present that transit experience was. In my family, it was extremely present, as you, you know, maybe saw with, with the artifacts. Uh, and that had to do with the fact that my mother was in Iran for 11 years, that she was the, you know, reluctant uh, migrant to the U.S., that she wanted to stay, that she uh, worked uh, for much of her post-war career as uh, the... Uh, administrative assistant secretary in the Middle East Department at Columbia when it was controlled by the um, Iranians. Uh, that, I mean, I always, you know, it's a joke, but it's true. I mean, I, that I, I mean, I thought until the age of, I think, 14, that inshallah was a German word. Uh, because, yeah, you know, my parents spoke German and they would very easily mix in uh, Farsi. Uh, that was their kind of private language, and uh, you know, and, and you know, they would say things like, you know, well, I, you know, I hope it doesn't rain tomorrow, inshallah, and and, and or don't drive so fast, yavash yavash, uh, or so yes, yeah, so the language was there, and this kind of you know what I call the sort of bric-a-brac of home furnishings. Leora Auslander is here; she can talk a lot about furnishings, right? Uh, this 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 mix of uh, the heritage that still came from uh, from Germany uh, with a very uh, obvious presence of of the artifacts, but also yes, the vodka, the caviar, the the celebrations of Norus, uh, the the graduate students from the Middle East Department who would come. And uh, and speak, and also the connections with these refugee circles. And this is also true for people who were in Shanghai. They met every other year for decades in the Catskills. At, at, you know, had their reunions. Uh, that I, for many people, it was those friendships that really. Uh, were were the most significant. So when you have all these jokes about, you know, okay, you saw the picture, the yekka in the desert, right? Uh, about the yekkas, the German Jews, wherever they were sticking together. If you start to poke, you see that they're not just sticking together, but very often they're sticking together with those people with whom they had shared the transit exile. Uh, so that was another layer of experience uh, that uh, that that was really important. So in my own life, it was very present. I mean, I my parents went back to Iran until the revolution quite frequent. I mean, not quite more several times. I went twice. Um, you know, drew me to India as well. Uh, so it's it it becomes part of your life. I don't think it's necessarily the same for uh, for everybody, but it is true that I keep meeting more and more people who are writing about, oh, my grandparents were in the Congo, or my grandparents were in Jamaica. Or... So I think there is this emerging uh, sense that this is a history we need to excavate because it's also a history we need right now. We really need to be able to tell those stories and make those connections. Well, Atina, I think we're going to stop there. Um, I want to thank you. I thought from your previous book, uh, German Jews and Allies, that I had learned so much more about what it meant to survive and what it meant to, you know, just sort of broadening our idea of what survival meant. And now I see with this new project, we're going even farther. And I can't wait to see this project continue to take shape. Thank you so much for talking with us tonight. Thank you to our audience. And please join us upstairs for a reception. Thank you.